Hello, and welcome to today's training industry leader talk, AI-powered learning solutions, sponsored by Biz Library, the Chivo, GP Strategies, Hemsley Fraser, and Skooks. I'm Dee Caraglino, event producer and your host for today. Before we dive into our next session, I would like to quickly go over a few housekeeping items to help you interact with our speakers and get the most out of today's sessions. Throughout the event, feel free to put your comments into the chat window and put questions into the Q&A window. We'll be monitoring those and saving them for Q&A toward the end of the session. We've enabled closed captions for this event, and you can turn those on or off by locating the closed caption icon in your toolbar. I encourage you to share the information you receive today via social media. Follow us on Twitter at Training Industry. That's Training Industry without the Y. Uh, we'll be engaging throughout the event, so please feel free to join in there. At the end of your time with us, you will notice a short survey in your browser, and we would appreciate your thoughts on today's event. Lastly, all of our sessions are being recorded and will be archived on trainingindustry.com, and you'll receive a follow-up email after today's event with a link to the on-demand sessions and materials. If this is your first training industry event, we'd like to welcome you. Training industry exists to make connections among learning and development professionals. We offer resources to support your role in L&D through live events, like today's Leader Talk, as well as through articles on our website, our magazine, conferences, research reports, and our podcast. Make training industry your go-to resource for learning solutions by visiting trainingindustry.com. And now, without any further ado, I would like to introduce you to our speakers from Hemsley Fraser, Matthew Prisco, Chief Product Officer, Laura Walker, Senior Associate Consultant, and Ben George, also Senior Associate Consultant. Welcome. Thanks very much, Dee. I am going to share a few slides with you lovely folks. So bear with me while I just get this organized. Okay, so Dee, can you just give me, let me know uh, verbally that you can see my slide deck, okay? I do not see it. Try again. Okay, hold on one sec. I'll stop sharing. Perfect. Yeah, there you go. Excellent. Okay, minor technical glitch. So welcome everybody. Uh, we are very much looking forward to this session with you all. Um, I guess before we start, some very brief introductions may be useful because we thought what would be good today would be to have a conversation around the impact of AI, specifically through the lens of what it means for a learning and development organization like us and learning and development teams in corporate organizations. So we want it to be a rich, engaging conversation from three different perspectives and personas. Hence, there's three of us in the conversation today. And we're going to try and keep it as interactive uh, as possible. We're going to be posing a few questions throughout and a poll. So we're really looking forward to your contribution in due course. So. With that in mind, I might kick things off if that's okay and then come to Laura and then Ben. Uh, my name is Matthew Prisco. I'm a Chief Product Officer at Hemsley Fraser. We provide corporate learning and development interventions for global organizations. And so one of the things that keeps me awake at night is, is what is the strategic impact of AI on our organization and also on our clients' organization, specifically from an L&D perspective? So, I'll be talking a bit around that later in the piece, and I'll hand over to uh, who's directly below me in the chat, Ben. So if you want to go next, Ben, that'd be great. Hi, everybody. I'm Ben George, and I'm a, an associate consultant with Hemsley Fraser. So I work with Matt and the team to provide solutions to clients. And I'm, I'm here to, today to share perspectives on how we've done that, share an example or two about how we've used generative AI to um, support to support solutions for our clients. So very excited to be in the conversation with you. And hi, I'm Laura Walker, and I work with Hemsley Fraser on a part-time basis as a specialist advisor, really, working on the latest um, trends and insight. Um, my main perspective and role is as a researcher practitioner so I'm a psychologist I do lots of research I'm currently doing a PhD so I have a healthy skepticism 
and a desire for an evidence base. So you'll probably see that coming through today also. Thanks, guys. So I think, you know, one of the things we really want to get from this session specifically is to think about what opportunities we have with AI collectively in what we think the, the good bits are, but also recognize and acknowledge some of the potential risks, pitfalls that may be in play when you think about trying to grapple with the sort of massive subject, which is AI, because as we've been just sort of talking about three different personas, three different perceptions, three different outlooks on what, where and how AI might be of assistance to us, specifically through the lens of AI. So if we just move on, um, the first thing we wanted to talk about, and, and myself in particular, was the strategic impact of L&D. So I think one of the things we're all very aware of, having been in the industry for uh, any length of time, that the L&D folks uh, amongst us, and probably more broadly than that in organisations, we love the current zeitgeist. So if you've been in the L&D industry any length of time, you know, once upon a time, it was e-learning and then it moved into mobile learning and then it was gamification, video content. So we've seen lots of sort of um, emerging themes and trends over the years. I think, you know, certainly from our perspective, they've all been good. Uh, they've all had, you know, pluses and minuses. I think one of the things we want to think about, you know, is how do we embrace AI and acknowledge and recognize that if we don't get it exactly right, it could actually have some damaging consequences on our organization. So one of the things we're looking at as an L&D company is thinking about how this, um, through what lens can we think about how AI is going to affect us and our customers. As a learning and development organization, our clients are looking for us for some guidance in and around kind of what, what good looks like from an adoption and utilization of AI. I think one of the things we wanted to sort of also say is, you know, as are we deep AI experts ourselves? No, and Hemsley Fraser is not trying or suggesting that they are AI experts in the development of um, the technology itself. But what we do have to try and do is work on a point of view in and around how we kind of bring it into our day day to day lives. How do we use it as an ongoing tool? How do we help it develop our, our capabilities? And through that, we've uh, and feel free to use this yourselves, we've built this uh, voice model who looks at a number of key things in and around how do you ascertain whether AI is going to create and generate value for your organization? What kind of outcomes can you expect from the adoption and utilization of an AI tool? What the experience is like for the end user? Um, what can they expect to get from it from a learning perspective, a learning experience? And ultimately, what the context is regards to, you know, how does that tool show up in the organization? How does it fit with the rest of what your learning offer looks and feels like? And um, ultimately, it's about the impact. So really ask yourself the questions in and around what is it we're trying to do as an L&D function? Where and how uh, can it provide these kind of key metrics? And so, you know, if you dig into any, you can dig into any of those in any order, particularly. But if you kind of ask yourself the questions around value, if you used an AI tool to generate more content, certainly you could be potentially more productive, but if that content's not utilized or engaged, can it be utilized? Is it gonna be good ROI if you've got more content? As we all know, there's a wealth of content out there. So more content doesn't necessarily equal better. Same as the experience, you know, what does the end user really want to see? Um, we all are familiar with the kind of notion of digital fatigue, so you know just think about what the tool is actually doing and providing um so i think that, that you know that's one model to look at it to look through the other component part is ai principles um we you know like many organizations are in the foothills of this so we are still sort of developing what we think you know good looks like trying to generate some best practice and so on um you could pick any one of these. I think you know, one of the key themes, and we'll come to this later in the piece with Laura, is thinking about boosting human skills. As more and more emerging technologies come through, the requirement for individuals and, and leaders in your business having the interaction with colleagues becomes more and more important so that they can foster a, a, nurture, a, 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 a learning culture and really help people through a transformation. Because when we kind of look at what's going on 
in the businesses we support, transformation and change is really at the core of everything that is underway currently. And it's because organizations are going through so much change, the way they interact with their customers, the way they're trying to do business, and they're looking at embracing all of these right tools. But if you don't have the human capability or human uh, cap capability to begin with, then you'll struggle to deliver on that. Um, I think another important part about what AI does and what it doesn't do. So there's, as we all know, there's a massive difference between knowledge find or knowledge share and learning. So what we think about as a learning organization is we have a very strict methodology when we apply, um, when we deliver any of our learning experiences, we always think about it through the lens of excite, engage, embed and evolve. And that's a constant thing you see in any of our learning interventions. So when we think about AI, you know, what, where and how does it work? So you have to be kind of putting it always into the context of what you need it to be doing and be its master rather than the other way around. So there's a few points there for you to uh, consider and mull over. Um, next in the piece, I wanted to ask my colleagues, Ben and Laura, a, a, a question. And the question is, do you think, guys, uh, L&D needs to lead the way for the business with its adoption of AI? Is it L&D's job to kind of get AI into the organisation? Uh, Laura, I'll come to you first, if I could. Yeah, personally, I would value the context of the organisation very highly. So in true psychology perspective, I'm going to say it depends um, on the system that you occupy. I mean, I've worked in six different industries, usually heading up L&D, talent management, et cetera, and they're very different in terms of the pace that they will take up something like this and the level of risk that they will adopt. So, for example, defense industry, engineering, pharma, you know, they're all, they have very different profiles, for example, to retail or financial services. So, um, I think it, it, it does depend, but um, I would say, certainly from my experience in pharma, that being a fast follower is the place to be. Yes. And I think in order to be a fast follower, you need to keep track of what's going on. But it doesn't mean that you have to throw yourself in at the deep end. <laughs> you do have to keep track of what's going on and, and time your step um, in well. Mm -hmm. What do you think, Ben? What's your perspective? Um, I think, yeah, it's, it's context dependent with all, all of the kind of solutions, I guess. Uh, I think the thing that I would kind of add to that is, I think it also depends on to what extent is AI or particularly generative AI and AI tools going to affect the roles within the organization um, and mean that you are going to be at a competitive advantage or less so. So, um, and and I think that sort of boils down to um, the amount of reskilling and to the extent of which reskilling becomes a strategic initiative um, or as part of like, a, a, you know, a larger change initiative. So um, I think it's dependent on the context of which the organization is going to be affected by um, uh, what this future sort of technology and the current technology is looking like. So and that seems to be reflective in some of the clients that we're working with. Um, you know, they're beginning to sort of map out what what the impact is on roles um, and see where these technologies can 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 help and what what the reskilling or relearning initiatives can can do to support. So it's not the only thing. It's part of the, the solution. Yeah, connected to that, Ben, and sort of follow on question was in around, do you think this is a new toy? With a limited shelf life or is this something uh, l and folks should be putting a lot of focus and attention on. I'll come to you first as you're in the chair, as they say. Okay, so as I, so, I'm I'm the enthusi I'm the enthusiast um, who will go out and try. So I'll go in with the optimistic. I do think it's a new shiny toy. When I started using this in January uh, last year, um, I was really taken aback by it, and it did seem to solve an awful lot of solutions, particularly somebody that's dyslexic. Just simple things like being able to write a decent, fast email response was sort of really just blew me away and it's and its ability to to do so many things very quickly lost trust with it or confidence with the tool a couple of weeks in a couple of months in perhaps um and there, there needed to be something else that i needed to sort of tweak and improve so this is sort of dunning kruger effect you know where we have this sort of overconfidence in the tech we lose it and then 
then you sort of there's this sort of middle path I'll, I'll hand over to Laura who I know will be um <laughs> a, a different perspective on this yeah um I mean for me I don't think it is a new tool anyway so I think you know we all know that AI has been around in some form or another clearly there's been an acceleration recently um with gen AI um so I'm generally a believer in the there's not really a very new tool ever if I'm completely honest there's usually some kind of foundation in the dim and distant history but I think the good news for humanity is that we're generally very good at responding to disruptive change so I kind of have faith that even if it is a new tool or if there's new versions of the tool that they will evolve and that as we will evolve um, as well but certainly I won't be uh, be using it to write all of my stuff yet uh, for me I'd say it does about 20 percent I think some people think it does 80 percent of content writing I, I'm more on the 20 percent yeah. okay I mean that's interesting I mean we, what we'd like to do now is bring you folks into this uh, conversation so we've got a poll for you um, we'll just go and move on to the next slide um, the question or the poll question at least is how often do you think L&D are using Gen AI for L&D specifically because it'd be really interesting to get sort of a, a pulse check of um, how, how often you guys use this so we're just going to let these uh, results come in. Oh, I'm trying to vote and I can't. No. I know, I tried to vote too. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, something certainly from the UK, uh, UK market specific um, research suggests that 40% of organisations in the UK have never used uh, AI to create anything specifically for the L&D function. 30% claim they use it rarely. Um, so maybe they're at the, uh, they, you know, they've tried it and fallen out of love with it, like Ben. And twenty percent say sometimes. So it's a very mixed bag. And I think you know, I think the takeaway certainly from the UK, and it'll be interesting to see what you guys vote. Um, we're very much at the begin. We're in the embryonic stages of really kind of getting this into day to day use as a, a, a as a successful tool in L and D. I'm just going to see, D, do we get, I can't, apologies, I can't see the poll results. I don't know if, oh, here they come. Okay. So, yeah, it's interesting. There's some very early adopters uh, who always use it, which is great to see. Um, yeah, I guess, yeah, it's kind of a mixed bag, really. Uh, probably not far away from where uh, the UK market is also uh, using L&D. So, with that in mind, let me just transition on to my next slide. Um, in the chat, can you guys just put in uh, how, for, the, the, for those that said they are using it, if you could just put into the chat um, one of these three options, that'd be really interesting because, um, these are the ways we, we can see it being utilized, but it'd also be interesting to know from yourselves whether there's any other areas that you can see value in or other experiences of how you might be using it currently. Because one of the things I think we've been grappling with is the idea of AI being able to create more content. You know, as Ben was articulating, he can use it to kind of write documents, maybe even write some content. We've been looking as an L&D organization, looking at branch learning scenarios, the idea of AI as a coach. There's lots of different ways we can kind of create more content. Um, I guess the question really is for us always to think, is more content good? And is there other ways in which we could be using AI perhaps more from the curation? Because, you know, my personal opinion is less is more. So it's about contextualization and relevance and really a positive learning experience rather than reams and reams of material that you can read. So, you know, there's, there's different ways in which you can slice and dice this. And I think that is a neat, neat segue into our next part, which is really looking at, you know, not forgetting whilst this emerging technology is great, there is also a, a strong requirement to ensure human skills are uh, on point. So with that, I'm gonna transition over to my colleague, Laura, who's gonna take us through this next section. Brilliant, thank you. 
So as I mentioned earlier on, I'm a psychologist, so I'm going to bring the human skills angle into the conversation, um, but also to look at some of the risks and opportunities um, that present themselves. Um, so I'm going to just share with you in a second some um, research that won't be a surprise to many of you about which are the top human skills that are coming through. So if you can nudge us on, please, Matthew, that would be sure. amazing. Thank you. Okay, so what we're finding from the various lists of what are the top skills for this year and going forward is that human skills are becoming more important, not less. So even with the emergence of AI and Gen AI, um, we are finding that these things are going even higher um, up the list. And for us to thrive in an AI driven workplace, some of these things are gonna become even more important. So for example, around um, critical thinking as we are evaluating the results that we get from our various um, chats uh, with AI, uh, that will become probably even more so. so. So what you can see here on the left is a list from our own Hemsey Fraser survey, but it's also very uh, aligned with the World Economic Forum and other bodies and the, their lists of the top human skills or the top skills, soft skills and otherwise. Um, that are relevant for today. And on the right hand side, you can see our management and leadership framework that we have at Hemsey Fraser. And these are the top 10 capabilities. And we don't anticipate any of these diminishing um, in importance. Um, if anything, they may take on a slightly different flavor in an AI driven world. So we'll come on to that in a minute uh, with some examples about what being authentic might mean uh, in an AI driven world or what connecting and um, building connectedness uh, might mean in an AI driven world, but they're still relevant. It's just how we go about them might be a bit different. If I can nudge you on please, Daniel. Matthew, okay, so the three risks I'm going to um, share as a perspective, so a point of view on opportunities and risks, the kind of two sides of the same coin. So what we find from a human psychology point of view is when these are present in abundance, people learn best. So if they are feeling really connected, like they belong somewhere, because we are wired to connect as humans. So we're wired neurologically and rewarded hormonally for connections. So if, there, if that is lacking in your AI enhanced learning, it's going to diminish the impact. But if some, in some way you can boost the connectedness using AI, then you've got a chance of even greater impact. So you, both sides of the coin you need to pay attention to. Matthew's already mentioned the four E's. Um, but there are opportunities to boost excitement, for example, or engagement. So in some ways, it's easier to create content that can be more engaging if you use some of the tools that are available um, to help you do that, like avatars or a whole variety of different tools. I think some of you in the uh, chat, we're talking about conversation, uh, using AI to practice conversations with uh, people. So using AI generated uh, conversation. So that would be a risk. So if you don't, if you just basically say, right, go and find the answer yourself through a chat uh, tool, chat, uh, chat GPT, for example, um, then chances are you're just not going to get the learning because very few people will change their behavior just by reading something. You just don't get that happening. In order to shift behavior, they need to embed the learning. They need to connect it with experiences they've already got in their mind, their ex in their brain, basically. And then they also, you need to evolve the learning. So it needs to be even more relevant. So again, a risk and opportunity. And the final um, image you have here is talking about the response to uncertainty. So we know it's an uncertain world and obviously AI is bringing its own uncertainty. And what we know from uh, research into organizations is that when they can provide, and leaders also, when leaders can provide enough stability for people, but also be agile enough to respond to things that emerge, they are 75% more likely to be in the top 25% of companies for organizational health. So the trick with AI is to provide enough stability 
So enough certainty about what, what's okay, what's not okay, but also enough agility to respond to what's going on. And again, if you don't do that, so if you don't provide enough stability um, with your approach to AI, chances are people's learning will be reduced. Mm. So just interesting. Yeah, very interesting, Laura. And I'd like to ask you both a question at this point um, connected to that. On a scale of one to 10, how concerned are you for the future of human skills and what and why? So, Ben, do you want to have a stab at that one first? Um, so, so, so 10 is high concern, one is low concern. I'm going to go... It could be either way, actually. I didn't, yeah, whichever way you want to interpret it. Um, <laughs> 10 I'm, being high, yeah. I, I, I'd be interested to get the group on this as well in terms of the chat. 10 being a high concern for human skills, one being a low concern. For the, forever the optimist, I'm going to go in as a as a three, um, so relatively low concern. Quacky, look at this. We've got a, a few high scores going into the chat, and I'll give you the reason why. I think it. I think we are extremely adaptable, and uh, as much as many of us, I'm sure, have been made slightly nervous by um, the capability of some of these tools for our jobs and for our colleagues, and how it will perhaps um, displace um the, the future of work i think we're adaptable i think um um in terms of how how human skills can be supported um will be dependent on how much of a strategic su um support and initiative will be deployed within the organ within organizations so people will be helped through training initiatives along with other um um, ways to help develop those those necessary skills so it won't necessarily directly um it will have a direct impact on human skills but i think with the right conditions it can be well supported um yeah that that would be my view so i uh, said so maybe a two or a three depending on the level of support Well, I can offer you a healthy seven, if that's uh, just to offer a different perspective. And I think I might have some friends in the chat. Um, I think you also yeah. have them too. Um, so my my scepticism is kind of in the short term. I'm slightly worried that we might get distracted onto AI and kind of ignore some of the things that we know are enduring and and even more important in the way that uh, that we just said. Um, I'm generally have faith in humanity, as I said earlier on, um, but I'm slightly worried that we'll lurch to um, some kind of weird and wonderful controls um, that I don't think is particularly what we need um, yeah. in the world of AI. Thanks, Laura. And I, I, you know, I kind of agree with you both. And certainly from my perspective, what I'm seeing in our clients that are asking for help in building out um, management and leadership capability is this idea of equipping managers and leaders and individual contributors to a certain extent with a certain skill set and i think that skill set of um capability is certainly different to what it was pre-pandemic so how people show up in organizations is changing how managers and leaders are meant to engage with their teams with each other is changing so i think what you know we can't to laura's point we shouldn't and can't take the eye off the ball because ultimately it doesn't matter what technology you have in an organization we firmly believe that people are still and will always be your best asset. Um, so with that in mind, it'd be really interesting to see what you folks uh, think are the most important uh, human skills, certainly in the context of this emerging technology in, in a gen AI world, matrix world. Uh, so we're gonna bring up another poll now. So it'd be uh, really interesting if you folks could have a think about what you think are the most important and let us know uh, why. So if we could bring up the poll, please, Dee. I'll just let you guys have a think about that momentarily. It's something like I could argue that they're all equally important. <laughs> Okay, so a few more seconds, and then um, hopefully we'll get the results. Yep, 
And if there's anything on the list that you think you know is more important, feel free to pop it into chat. It'd be good to see uh, other ideas coming into this as well. Mm -hmm. Liam, I've asked a tough question there with you. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Well, uh, Dee, are we going to? Here we go. What are we? The critical thinking. Yeah. Interesting communication and change is so low in that equation. Uh, we could spend the next hour or more discussing that. Uh, we don't, sadly, we don't have time. So um, thanks everyone for uh, putting in your uh, perspective there. We're just going to move on in the discussion now, um, moving into the innovation space and kind of practical ideas on how you can use AI. So um, with that, we're going to get its the super fan on the call or in the conversation, Ben, to pick up this part of the conversation. Thanks, Matthew. Um, I just, if you jump to the next slide for us, that'd be great. We just wanted, it's been lovely. Thank you everybody for sharing your um, your thoughts in the chat. Clearly there's an enthusiasm for this. And um, I saw the scores coming in earlier. Um, and then we've seen some examples um, in the chat already. So there seems to be lots of, um, lots of, um, different ways people have been using uh, particularly generative AI and on the screen uh, uh, you can see just some examples of the way that we've been using um, uh, some of the some of the approaches to particularly with to, to generative AI particularly with chat GPT and trying to play around with making it useful and effective uh, based on our kind of experiences so I'm going to pull out just a couple of examples of these on our following slide um, but, but I think one that I found particularly useful with our clients is um, when exploring things like performance support and job aids, um, as well as some of the experiences that Matthew alluded to. And we'll come on to some specific examples of those in a minute. Um, and some of the sort of more, more I think, um, latest updates that we've found particularly useful. Um, I think ultimately, if I was to sort of summarize what I've seen in, in the chat, one of the challenges with this um, new bit of technology is the fact that we can kind of lose confidence with it um, quite quickly. And that's been my experience from being somebody that was just amazed by its capability, still am, um, to, to then moving into sort of a lack of confidence in it. You know, you have to do a lot of the checking um, and that sort of, you know, I don't want to be doing the checking. I want it to do it um, more effectively. Um, so we have to apply some human aspect of critical thinking, some of the things we've just been speaking about. So if I could, could I ask you to go to the next slide and I'll give you a couple of examples of that, that, that I think have, I found particularly useful working with some of our clients. Um, so it's not all about training. It's also um, thinking about um, how you enable people to frankly, just be better at their job. They don't need to go on courses. So what I found particularly useful is the ability to generate um, performance support tools. So that could be a checklist for a new manager, the things to do and not do over the first 90 days or 30 days. It could be a checklist or a worksheet that, that it creates based on how to have a difficult conversation, the typical challenges that people wrestle and struggle with. So that's been a really useful one. And from our client's perspective, we're able to build out those tools a lot faster than we're able to before. Still need the human um, touch. You still need to have the expertise to be able to qualify um, the outputs, of course. But that's, that seems to be an area that has um, had a, a huge impact. So performance support tools. The next one is... Uh, the next one was around how we can increase the speed and I'd argue as well, the quality of the learning experiences that we can create. So some of the things that I'm sure many of you that are in this space that, that design and develop solutions often, you know, we can sort of spend a lot of time figuring things out and ChatGPT can put through a relatively complex, put together a relatively complex simulation. Um, that would take, frankly, me days and a team of us days um, quite quickly. So we can create complex decision tree scenarios and simulations that really do challenge the learner in, let's say, a facilitated synchronous environment. Um, and I think that's been quite useful as well to challenge what we can do. We all get stuck in our kind of ways of doing things and, you know, just using it as a simple brainstorming tool that helps us then pick into more complex, more interesting challenges for our solutions. So. Those would be the sort of the ones that we were up to last year and we've been sort of exploring and, and developing. This year, it's all been about um, AI, developing AI uh, mentors. So probably wouldn't use the word coach for this. 
So without being too pedantic on the terms. Um, and what ChatGPT has been able to release in the last few weeks is, has, has been able to basically qualify the data that it, that it uses. So we now can build our own GPTs for our programs that are content specific and topic specific based on the content we want to feed it. So rather than relying on this huge database of data that it's using that can often hallucinate, now we can hone it down to specific content um, that we want it to use and generate. So for each topic, for example, on a program that we want, let's say a management leadership program to be focused around, we can now program that or give the, the right kind of data to the GPT that, that then supplements the outcomes. So for example, let's, let's use challenging conversations. We can use our framework to have a challenging conversation. So if a manager ever needs to um, quickly find out a quick, quick sheet or get some advice, we've got 24 hours access to um, a challenging conversation mentor that can that can you know provide a much more high quality response to to their need when they need it so it's in the flow of work it can be on a mobile phone for example so the ability to build your own gpts content specific organization specific you know came out a couple of weeks back and we've um, fortunately been able to um start the work on testing that with a client um, one of our global sort of clients in the insurance industry on how we provide that as an additional tool to help managers um, uh, develop their capability. So those would be our three areas. The one on the right um, is probably the more recent. Last literally few weeks, we've been testing that and we'll be getting it out to the program in the next, what well, we're launching on Friday. So I'm, I'm hoping we can uh, uh, do that quite quickly. Cool. Okay, it, it, with that in mind, just uh, a final question already to sort of discuss as a group would be you know, how much time and investment do you think LND should be putting into these into this at the moment? What you'll take, Laura? As an LD function yes. or as an LD team. Yeah. Um well, you know, I'm the uh, the fast follower philosophy. So I do think it's worth keeping up to date with what's going on and um always believe in curiosity and um getting ideas. So I think it it is worth putting some time into it. There might be a member of the team who is more adept than others, so they could be the champion um, yeah. for it. Um, so I, I wouldn't say loads, but I would say, you know, be be ready to to shift when you need to. Yeah. And Ben? So the question's around how much focus should it be? Yeah. I think, I think yeah, I think there's there's two, there's two areas of focus um, or two maybe broad strategies to think about. One is Getting, getting people that are enthusiasts to play with it, find out what works and what doesn't. Um, so that's sort of like almost like an incubator hub of people within your team to try and do that. They inform the rest of the folks. They're perhaps a little bit more skeptical or less, less willing to, to focus. And I think there needs to be perhaps another sort of strand, which is governance, right? So, you know, a decision-making um, operational sort of more broad strategic team that that um, help decide what what goes and what doesn't. Um, you know, I can see people writing in the chat around data and security and things like that, which are obviously a concern. Um, so yeah, those would be my two. Um, in terms of effort, I think this is. And you know, I was looking at some of the comments um, coming through earlier. I, I I do think this is an iPhone moment, right? Um, where you know, two thousand and seven, the iPhone was launched, that touchscreen thing. And if you listen to that launch, you could hear people gasping in the background. I'd be one of those people with ChatGPT. And just look at how these sort of phones have, you know, influenced our livelihood. You know, they're, you know, my kids barely speak to me anymore based on their their phone obsession. So um, I think it's as big as that. You know, it's going to be, I think it's going to be transformative, and it, therefore we need to help people maximize maximize the uh, the potential for it. Okay. Great, thanks, Ben. You know, for me, I think you know, a combination of. Both of what you said, I think, you know, as L and D functions, you have to be experimenting and innovating. You have to be kind of formulating your own perspective on how this can work for you because it's kind of wild west at the moment. Uh, there's a lot going on. There's a lot to kind of take on board. But if you're not experimenting and trying, then you're probably behind the curve. So it's really about trying to get on the wave and ride it to the best of your abilities, as they say. Um, quick question uh, before we go to Q and A. Um, Again, back to the room, uh, what barriers do you think there are uh, to adopt AI? It'd be really interesting. I know uh, some of you have been posting this in the chat already, but what do you think are some of the sort of fundamental barriers uh, to kind of try and get that experimentation under underway? 
I'll just give you a couple of seconds to do that. There you go, security uh, number one. Yeah, uh, as we said earlier in the piece, there are, you know, whilst it presents massive opportunities, um, as we've said throughout the piece, I think governance and security is something absolutely you've got to get your uh, house in order uh, just to avoid any potential risks, because whilst there is huge amounts of opportunities, there's some also ob fairly obvious pitfalls. So thanks everybody for that. We've got one or two more slides. Um, to get through uh we've got i think four four or so minutes left so we'd love to kind of open this up to q and a um d i'll let you sort of take over the facilitation of this part to ask you know how you want people to put in their questions or to open the floor up to those that want to contribute to the conversation it's absolutely you can drop your questions into the q and a panel and i have a couple that i've picked up from the chat um one was, can you provide a specific example for building connectedness into learning alongside AI? Well, interestingly, yeah. So, um, so when I was in a pharmaceutical company um, a while back, one of the things they did was they used AI in their email system. So they used it to analyze the email system to see who was, were, who was sending emails about a topic, and then they could share that um, so who was it? And it, it was kind of working as knowledge management, basically. So they knew who was interested in a topic, topic, and then they could share and connect people who were also emailing on that topic. So they didn't need a separate knowledge management system. They could use AI to help them do that. So that's just a very practical, quick <laughs> example. Uh, let's see. Martin wants to know, how would you see AI working alongside an LMS? With parentheses, the hub. Yeah. Hey, Martin. Nice to see you uh, or hear from you. Um, uh, to me, the AI has to be integrated into the LMS. You know, I, you know, I've got some fairly controversial ideas around how and where LMS market is going to go, but I, I envisage, you know, with AI creating more opportunities for integration, LMS is going to become less relevant. So I think it's really about embedding the search capabilities to kind of do that content curation for you into the LMS. Um, if you're looking at it through the lens of that kind of uh, application, because obviously as we've been saying throughout, there's other ways you can use AI in content curation, et cetera, and um, content writing. But if you're using it as a, for its search functionality and capabilities and curation capabilities, it has to be integrated. So, you know, I'd be asking your LMS providers how and where they're putting in the AI. Uh, let's see. Kim points out that there is a wealth of information, possibly overwhelming information. Um, you know, is, do you have any advice for so sifting through all that to figure out which, which partner you should use? Um, we do. Uh, so let I me you might jump on, Matthew, because there's some. Yes. <laughs> We've got some insights here, which we. Thank you, whoever teed that up. Uh, perfect segue into, <laughs> into one of our final slides, which is we obviously we're always looking at resources that help formulate our ideas. There's loads of people out there doing similar research to us, including you know, all, your, all of your good selves. Um, these are two recommended pieces of reading. Uh, so if you just get your phones out, you can scan these and read the corresponding information. And Hemsley Fraser, themselves have also done uh, a series of podcasts on this and um, the good, the bad and the ugly, which you can find on Spotify and other locations. Um, I'm conscious Dee, that we are approaching. I, think I don't we know can if squeeze find... in one more quick question. Yeah, sure. Oh, sorry, I thought Ben was going to answer one. Um, let's see. Manuel wants to know if AI is going to substitute humans. <laughs> well, Elon Musk thinks we won't need to go to work soon, so I'm well up for that. So whenever that happens, <laughs> um, um, I see he's also asked about um, AI in the coaching approach. So using um, AI as a coach, and I've seen AI worked in a couple of particularly good ways. Actually, it can't—I wouldn't say it ever replaces coaching. I mean, I do coaching, and I wouldn't say it replaces a 
a human coach over a period of time, but I think it can be really useful to help self-coach. So I think if there's an occasion where you could self-coach, I think it can be particularly useful. Um, and also I've seen it work really well where people are practicing giving feedback um, and there's evidence to show that people give more effective feedback to an avatar than they do when they're doing a strange role play, which we all hate doing in training courses anyway. So in, in replacement for, for that, it can be a really good way to practice some of those human skills um, that we were talking about earlier on. Well, once again, we have run out of time, but um, I would like to thank all of you for providing such fantastic information and hope that people will connect with you afterward to continue this conversation. Thanks, everyone. And thanks very much, Dee, Laura, Ben. See you guys all very soon. Take care. Thanks, thank everyone. You. So up next, we will take a 15 minute break and then we will be joined by Maya Mickles from Docebo. Her session is how to position L&D for skills-based AI success. So we'll be ending this session in just a moment, take a quick break and join us again in the next session at the top of the hour. Thank you. <laughs>